On November 24, 1989, Central Washington University student 18-year-old Mandy Stavik suddenly went missing after taking a jog through her neighborhood. Her body was discovered by a search team three days later in a nearby river. So what exactly happened to Mandy? Did she drown while taking a swim? Or did something much more sinister happen to her? Welcome back to M7 Crime Storytime, where we cover solved, unsolved, and twisted cases from across the globe. Today's case will take us to Acme, a town in Whatcom County, Washington, United States. It's located in the South Fork Valley between the Northern Cascade Mountains and Lake Whatcom. The town is locally known as a scenic area and contains several camping opportunities along Lake Whatcom. Many people who live in the place choose it because of its good reputation, as well as its closeness to several parks and recreational areas. Mandy was born on the 16th of April, 1971, to Glenn and Mary Stavick. She was not an only child, but had three siblings by the names of Brent, Lee, and Molly. In 1974, Glenn and Mary's marriage came crashing down, and they went their separate ways. Brent, who was Mandy's older brother, died the following year at the age of 17 during a hunting trip in Alaska. Following this, Mary relocated from Palmer, Alaska to Acme with her three children and they began a new life there. Mandy was in the seventh grade around this time. She soon got used to her new environment and also became a popular face around the neighborhood. She was full of life and it was just impossible not to love her. At school in her new environment, Mandy excelled not only in academics, but also in other extracurricular activities. She was a member of the school band, and she could play the flute, clarinet, and saxophone. She also had a love for athletics, and this made her join the basketball team. Her passion for sports did not stop there, as she could also play softball and ride on horseback. She wanted to do everything. She wanted to be very good at everything she did. And she was. Mary, Mandy's mother, had said. She was a high achiever, a former teacher of Mandy told the media. She wanted to do well in everything she did. She had it all going for her. She had a bright future ahead of her. The house where Mandy lived together with her mother and siblings was located on Strand Road and was about a mile from the highway. And about five miles from the house was a river popularly referred to as Nooksack River by the locals. Mandy was in the habit of jogging around her neighborhood, She'd often start from her house and run westbound toward the west side of the Strand Road and down to the Nooksack River. It was her favorite route, and her mother Mary and the family German shepherd named Kyra joined her occasionally on her run. However, Mary usually rode a bike instead of jogging alongside her daughter. By the time Mandy graduated from Mount Baker High School, she was conversant in sign language. To top it off, she graduated as an honors student, and her mother's joy knew no bounds. Mandy had big dreams and hoped one day to become a commercial pilot. With this burning desire, she went to Central Washington University at the age of 18 and believed that in a few years, she would have obtained her commercial pilot's license. However, after only a few months of experiencing university life, she realized that being a commercial airline pilot was not, after all, something she was passionate about. She just couldn't see herself sitting for long hours in front of the flight instrument panel of an aircraft. And due to this, she decided to choose a different career path. At her new school, she met Yoko, a Japanese girl who was also pursuing a degree at the university. The two were roommates and they quickly went on to become great friends. From Yoko, Mandy learned the rudiments of the Japanese language, and in no time, she was speaking it fairly fluently. Mandy was also in a relationship with a guy whose name was Rick Zender. It was an affair that her family and friends were well aware of. The two had been dating right from when she was in high school. In November 1989, Central Washington University observed Thanksgiving, and students were allowed to go home to spend time with their families and loved ones. Mandy said goodbye to her friends at school and traveled down to Acme to be with her family. Yoko also went along with her. When the two arrived there, everyone was happy to see them. It was a full house as some relatives were also around for the holiday. Mandy quickly went around to introduce her Japanese friend and in no time, 
Yoko was feeling like she'd been part of the family for a long time. The atmosphere around the house was generally a lively one, and no one had any idea that a terrible disaster was close by. The present was what they were all focused on, and they went about eating and drinking with no worry for the future. The following day, which was November 24th, Mandy and Yoko got out of the house and took a walk around the neighborhood. She used the opportunity to show her excited friends some points of interest. When they got back to the house, they settled down to a tasty meal. Around 2 p.m., Mandy announced that she was going out for a jog. Mary could not join her because she was busy attending to the relatives that were around. Yoko also decided to stay indoors and busy herself with something else. Mandy changed into a light-colored sweatshirt and teal-green sweatpants. On her feet, she wore light blue running shoes that had purple stripes. She also grabbed her Walkman so she could listen to music while out jogging. At around 2.30 p.m., she left the house and Kyra the German Shepherd followed at her heels. That was the last time she would be seen alive by her mother. Two hours went by and neither Mandy nor the dog returned. Mary began to slightly worry. She knew her daughter was someone who kept a routine and so she should have been back from her jog. It was very unusual. I was panicked. She was so consistent in what she always did. There was no reason for her not to come back, Mary said. While Mary was still trying to figure out what might be wrong, Kyra bounded into the house with her tail tucked between her legs. Mary looked around for Mandy, but realized that the dog had returned alone. She immediately dialed Rick's number as she felt Mandy might have stopped by her boyfriend's place before finally coming home. However, when Rick picked up, it wasn't the word she was expecting that she heard. He told her that he hadn't seen Mandy and she knew immediately that something was terribly wrong. After getting off the phone with Rick, she called the sheriff and told him about what had happened. She also called as many people as she could think of to inform them about Mandy's disappearance. In no time, a majority of the community, as well as police officers, were out searching for her. People also came forward to give accounts of how they'd seen her jogging around in the afternoon of that day. Lee, my son, he was at the Anderson's house, which is about halfway between my house and Highway 9 down Strand Road, Mary said. He was there visiting his friend, Jeremy. He remembered seeing her jog by, coming home, she added. The search for Mandy for that day proved to be futile, and neither did Mandy return home. The following day, the search intensified, and Detective Ron Peterson led a team of officers to look through the woods and various places around the neighborhood, especially along the trail where she was known to jog. But there was no sign of her anywhere. Two days after Mandy vanished without a trace, a team that was assigned to search for her came across something odd. They were checking the side of the road when one of them saw a pair of green sweatpants. Mary was called to the scene to identify if the clothing items were Mandy's. I didn't remember exactly what she was wearing, but I didn't think they could have been. For one thing, they were dirty, and they had ripped holes in them, and Mandy wouldn't have ever worn anything like that, Mary said. Due to Mary's uncertainty, the pants were collected and sent to the laboratory for analysis to determine if they were Mandy's, but the results returned nothing that could be of help. November 27, 1989, made it three days since Mandy went missing. Her family were devastated about not knowing what had become of her, but they remained hopeful that she would be found alive. The hope was that they'd find her alive, Mandy's older sister, Molly, said. We just prayed that they would find her alive. You think to yourself, God, maybe she's just hurt. She can't get home, she added. Officers decided to also look at the surrounding water bodies, and with the help of a boat owned by a neighboring district fire department, they began their search of the Nooksack River. Detective Ron led the team. We came around the corner and we got out of the main river, and then into a little side channel, and I could see pink. Something pink, Detective Ron said. The object they saw was stuck in some river debris, and when they got close enough, they realized that it was the body of the woman they'd been looking for. She was not wearing anything except for the striped running shoes she'd worn out to jog several days earlier. The search team stopped the boat and Detective Ron got inside the knee-deep water to retrieve Mandy's body. Afterwards, it was placed in a body bag and taken away for autopsy. 
Mandy's family were informed about the discovery and the state in which her body had been found. They were simply shattered by the news. It was all too much to take in. I remember running out of the house. I ran off into the field and I just remember screaming, screaming at life, at God. How could something like this happen? How could he let something like that happen? Molly said. When news of Mandy's death spread, the community was thrown into commotion. The fact that a murder had been committed in a place that was usually very peaceful and incident-free was unsettling, and residents began to eye each other suspiciously. Detectives immediately began an investigation to understand what had really happened to Mandy. The state of undress in which she'd been found made detectives strongly suspect foul play. However, there was no way to tell this for sure since the area she'd been found in was undisturbed and there was no obvious sign of struggle. There were scratches on Mandy's arms and legs, and detectives believed that she must have gotten them while running through thorns. She also had an obvious injury at the back of her head. The autopsy that was conducted the following day after the body was recovered revealed that she had died by drowning. Detectives were puzzled by this because the part of the river where her body was found was shallow, and so it seemed very impossible that it had been an accidental drowning. There was also evidence to suggest that she'd been sexually abused, and detectives knew at that moment that they had a case of homicide on their hands. They speculated that whomever killed Mandy had abducted her using a weapon. They believed whomever it was had then sexually assaulted her, and after this, she'd tried to flee. The assailant had caught up with her and hit the back of her head with an object. He then proceeded to drown her in the river. The first person the authorities suspected of having something to do with the whole situation was Rick. He was immediately questioned. However, detectives saw nothing that could have tied him to Mandy's death, and he was cleared. To further shed more light on the situation, Detective Ron, who had undergone training at the time on the recovery of DNA, was able to collect DNA evidence from Mandy's body and sent it to the FBI for testing. The profile of an unknown male was soon established, and when it was checked against the database, no match was found. From there, the investigation intensified. Detectives followed up on tips that were received from well-meaning individuals, but none of this yielded any result. Several people were interviewed, and the DNA of about 30 men in Acme were analyzed, but nothing came out of it. On December 4, 1989, a memorial service was held for Mandy at her former high school. It was a sad day, and about a thousand students attended the two-hour-long service to pay their respect to her. During the service, Mary, with pain evident in her voice, had said the following, Mandy was a real survivor, and one of our philosophies... Mandy's and mine, was to take a bad situation, any bad situation, and try to make it a learning lesson and try to grow from it and profit from it. This tragedy is a real challenge to me to try to live up to that. It hasn't been easy. But on the other hand, I have made some friends. Since there was not much to go on, the case went cold. Years went by and Mandy's killer remained a mystery. In 2009, the case was assigned to Detective Kevin Bohe. He immediately got to work and began taking a close look at the evidence that was available. I started going through who's been interviewed, who's been talked to, Detective Kevin said. He got to find out about a drug dealer by the name of John Wisniewski who had been questioned in the past about the murder. John at the time had claimed that he knew who killed Mandy, but upon questioning, police were unable to get any meaningful information out of him. John's DNA also did not match the DNA that was recovered from Mandy's body, so he was ruled out as a potential suspect. Detective Kevin decided to once again interrogate and see what he could get out of him. He traveled to Cambodia where John had moved to, but in the end, nothing came out of it. The case would remain stagnant until the unexpected happened three years later. One day in June 2013, Two unrelated women by the name of Mary Lee Anderson and Heather Backstrom, who lived near Bellingham, a city about 35 minutes' drive from Acme, decided to take their kids to the local park. While their little children played a short distance away, the two women sat with a group of other mothers and they began chatting about their respective families and life in general. 
Soon the conversation centered on the unsolved murder of Mandy that had taken place several years earlier. All of a sudden, Heather said that she knew who the killer was. With surprise written all over her face, Mary Lee also said she knew who it was. At that point, the two women barely knew each other, although they had both attended Mount Baker High School as teenagers. As it turned out, the two women had suspicions about the same man. And that man's name was Timothy Bass. Intrigued by the fact that they were both talking about the same individual, the two exchanged stories of their past encounter with Timothy. According to the story Mary Lee shared, Timothy was a friend of her husband, and one night while she was home alone with her child, he'd stopped in from a hunting trip to use the house phone. After attempting to dial a number which did not go through, he then walked over to the bedroom where she was. There, he told her that he wanted to make love to her. Mary Lee was shocked by the audacity and threatened to call the police on him. He persisted with his talks, but in the end, she managed to get him out of the house. Heather's experience with Timothy, on the other hand, happened when she was 15. It was after a softball game in the summer of 1989, a few months before Mandy's murder, Heather said. We decided, a bunch of us, to go to Dairy Queen, she added. She'd been sitting in the front seat of a truck driven by a guy named Dan. Sitting beside her was also Timothy, and during the course of the journey, he began to aggressively flirt with her. He would talk about my eyes and say that my eyes were beautiful. Then he took, like, a pen out of a cup holder and would, like, start rubbing it along my knees because I was wearing cut-off sweatpants. Timothy did not go too far with his act, probably due to the presence of Dan. But ever since that day... The memory stuck with Heather, and she tried as much as possible to avoid him in the neighborhood. After sharing their disturbing experiences, they grew even more certain that he knew something about Mandy's murder. Mary Lee reached out to Detective Ken Gates, who had been her high school classmate and was working at the Wetcom Sheriff's Office. She told of his suspicion about Timothy and also gave the reasons why she had them. I really wasn't ready because we're in a small town. And to accuse someone of something we don't know for sure is a little scary, Mary Lee said. Detective Gates and the other detectives assigned to Mandy's case began unraveling as much as they could about Timothy. What they found out was that he had no criminal record, but something else about him caught their attention. Back in 1989, at the time of the murder, Timothy and his family had been living in a house that was right along Mandy's favorite running route. Where he lived was not too far from Mandy's house. His family was well-liked in the community, and he had also attended the same high school as Mandy. In January 1990, he'd gotten married to a woman by the name of Gina Malone and moved to Everson. This is a city in Washington that's about 19 miles north of Acme. The union between Timothy and Gina produced three children, and he was leading a pretty normal and quiet life, working as a delivery driver for a bakery known as the France Bakery Outlet. Detectives also discovered that none of the male members of Timothy's family, including him, had been asked to provide their DNA for testing. Due to this, detectives decided to pay him a visit at his home. When they got there, they talked to him about Mandy, but his response suggested that he could barely remember who she was. That was definitely a red flag for me, which indicated to me that he was obviously lying, Detective Kevin said. Everybody knew what the Mandy Stavik case was, and she ran past his house every day. How could you not know it? Timothy was then asked for saliva samples so that they could obtain his DNA, but he refused. The reason he gave was that he did not trust them. He told them that he had watched crime shows and seen how people went to prison after giving their DNA. This only made detectives grow more suspicious of him, but since they could not force him to give his DNA they took their leave. But since that day, they began to watch him more closely. Detectives also went to his workplace and met with a woman by the name of Kim Wagner. She was the manager of the bakery. They told her that they were investigating Timothy and needed help in obtaining his DNA, but they didn't reveal to her what exactly they were investigating him for. They came in, they said that there's an employee here under investigation for a case and they'd like to get a root information and maybe collect a cigarette butt in there. At that point, I just shut them down. I was like, yeah, no, this is not, this is way above my pay grade. 
she immediately directed them to the Human Resources Department, and there, detectives met with a brick wall. The owner of the bakery refused to be of help after finding out what the detectives were there for. They wanted a subpoena or a search warrant, and we didn't have sufficient probable cause to get a warrant, Whatcom County Sheriff Bill Elfo said. It was a disappointing period for detectives, and they had to accept a temporary defeat. Around 2017, the bakery manager, Kim, her husband and some friends were having a random discussion in the comfort of their home. The topic soon shifted to the 1989 murder and how Timothy used to live on the same street as Mandy. At that moment, it occurred to Kim that detectives had been to her workplace years back because they were investigating Timothy in connection to the murder. A short while after this, detectives went back once again to the bakery with the hopes of getting Timothy's delivery route. When they got there, they met with Kim, and this time around, she offered to help them get Timothy's DNA sample. They had to decline her offer because they did not want to use a civilian in their investigative work. However, they agreed to accept any evidence she brought to them. I 100% volunteered to do it, Kim said. The reason I wanted to know was I'm a mom now. If something happened to my daughter, I'd want someone to help me. And the thought of her mom never having an answer of who did that to her daughter, if I could help her find that piece, I wanted to do it. For several weeks, Kim had no luck with getting her hands on any item that contained Timothy's DNA. For some strange reason, he always took his trash home with him and was also in the habit of wearing gloves while working. Then one day, he probably got carried away and threw away a plastic cup. Luckily, Kim saw him doing this and she acted fast. I looked in the garbage and my heart was like beating out of my chest, Kim said. I grabbed it and I put it in my desk drawer. I was like, oh my God, that just happened. She eventually passed on the cup to detectives who immediately sent it for testing. All that was left was to wait. So about three months later, we got the results from the state crime lab and Katie from the crime lab says, Kevin, we've got a match, Detective Kevin said. After hearing those words, Detective Kevin was overjoyed. He knew that after so many years, the case was finally solved. On December 12, 2017, detectives went to Timothy's workplace and arrested him there. He was charged with rape and first-degree murder of Mandy. When he was interrogated, he denied having anything to do with the murder, but told detectives that both he and Mandy had been having a secret relationship and the reason why his DNA was found inside her was that he had slept with her hours before she disappeared. When Mandy's family heard Timothy's claim about a secret relationship, they immediately made it clear that he was lying. There's no way my sister would have a relationship, a physical relationship with Tim Bass, Molly said. She was way, way, way out of his league, to put it bluntly. Since Timothy maintained his innocence, the case went to trial. But months before the trial began, his attorneys made attempts to have the DNA evidence rendered invalid. Their reason was that the way detectives had collected the evidence violated Timothy's Fourth Amendment right. However, much to their disappointment, a judge decided that the evidence would be presented at trial. During this period, Timothy's wife, Gina, filed for divorce. The trial began in May 2019, and during the two weeks it lasted, Timothy's attorney tried to convince the court that he was guiltless. However, many witnesses, including Timothy's younger brother, Tom Bass, came forward to give testimony against him that further sealed his fate. When Tom was called to the witness stand, he revealed that while Timothy was under investigation, he had told him that he had slept with Mandy several years back. He then asked Tom to lie to the police also that he had slept with her. Tom also recounted another incident where Timothy had asked his mother to also lie that they were Christmas shopping at the time of Mandy's disappearance. Despite all of these revelations, Timothy's attorney still tried to give an excuse for his actions, but the jury was not moved. They had made up their minds. On May 24, 2019, Timothy was found guilty of Mandy's murder, and at the age of 50, he was sentenced to 27 years in prison. For Mandy's family, the sentencing brought a sense of comfort. Mary, who never thought the case would one day be solved, had the following to say. Definitely closure, I feel. After all, they've got the guy that did it. He'll spend enough years in jail, so if he ever does get out, his life will be practically over. 
Sadly, the life of a young, beautiful, and ambitious woman like Mandy was brought to an abrupt end. However, there's still the relief in knowing that her killer has been brought to justice. But do you think there's a chance that both Mandy and Timothy had a secret affair? Or was it something he said out of desperation? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. Please don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Until next time, stay safe.